New York City is an international coffee capital. With hundreds of nations represented, there's coffee for every palate and every price point, from the fancy $10 espresso drink to the $2 corner coffee cart. Finding coffee that's rooted in different cultures is easy. Anywhere you go, you can find coffee that's rooted in a different culture. Get on public transportation and go to any country. If I want to try, say, a Malaysian-style cold coffee, I can go to Queens or I can go to Chinatown. If I want to try Colombian-style coffee or South American, just go to that borough, go to that neighborhood. The cultural richness that we have from people from all over the world that come and live here and work here and the coffee traditions that they have, it's all there. Pour yourself another cup and get comfy. It's all things coffee on this special episode of Native Dish. New York's coffee selections can be overwhelming. You might feel intimidated when you order your first cup of, say, Singaporean kopi. What to do? Ask questions, try different flavors, and get friendly with your barista. The barista will take the time to for it to educate you if you want it. I like to watch what they're making, and the more you try anything, of course, it just becomes less scary and much more familiar. But in ancient times, baristas, as we know them today, didn't wear aprons or stand behind counters. Back then, they presided over coffee gatherings in traditional clothes and would brew without electricity or modern tools. The way coffee is harvested hasn't changed much either. To get the scoop on how a bean becomes a brew, I set off to learn more about the motherland of coffee, Ethiopia. This is where the coffee plant originated in the 9th century in the then region of Kaffa, which is today's Ethiopia. Buna is the Ethiopian word for coffee, and it's also the name of a restaurant in Bushwick, Brooklyn, where owner Liu Ayelu keeps the traditional method of coffee brewing alive. Liu hails from Addis Abeba, Ethiopia's capital and largest city. He used to give guided tours of his home city and its coffee plantations. With the help of friends and business partners, Buna Cafe has become an extension of his desire to teach New Yorkers about his culture. I got on the eastbound L train to Morgan Avenue to meet up with Liu and to learn more about his native land's traditional coffee ceremony. The art of coffee in Ethiopia is a core cultural custom, isn't it? It's almost sacred. I have such a strong memory mm. of like the coffee culture in Ethiopia. My mother would come from work and then set up our coffee ceremony. It's a spiritual practice. They go in groups as friends. When you say, let's have coffee, it means like, let's catch up. And, yes, and share. Yeah, share. And, and it's and the same in the family. Growing up, especially as a young boy, you will be sent to the neighbors to invite the neighbors for the coffee ceremony. Coffee, the way it's enjoyed, is typically black with some sugar, maybe some spices. Is that Different right? Different ways. Actually, the older people drink with salt. Ah, because yeah. salt does tone down any bitterness in yeah. coffee. Yeah. So it's actually more palatable. Yeah. Traditionally, people drink their coffee with butter. Ethiopian households drink coffee all day long, usually in three rounds. Once the first brew is consumed, more hot water is added to enjoy another round. And each round has its own name. Look at this beautiful table. We have all of our utensils for the coffee ceremony. This is the javana. This is what we use to brew the coffee. Mm -hmm. The basic method for making traditional Ethiopian coffee is simple. Wash raw green coffee beans with water at least three times. So it's kind of rubbing Here to get the rubbing. sediment, any yeah. sand, okay. dirt. The skin from the coffee bean also. This is very comparable to in Korean when, when I used to cook rice. Like that would be my chore growing up. Yeah. Then dry roast them in a pan over heat until they darken in color. You get a good bicep workout doing this. Mm -hmm. Now all these sparks are flying. Is that normal? Yeah, those the sparks are coming from the, the dry leaf that's flying off. If you went to anyone's home and someone's doing this for you, just the effort alone is, is such a, a gesture of thought and caring. Oh wow, now I see some smoke coming out a little bit. You can smell it. It's like a smoky flavor. Oh yeah. It's changing oh, color a lot oh, more. Oh, it's just going to be the best tasting coffee ever because I put so much effort into it. <laughs> Once it's ready, you let people smell. Oh! And people go like this. 
Try to smell it. Yeah, it does. It smells it. fruity. Blueberry. Hmm. Hmm. That smells rich. Yeah. Then grind and boil or brew our coffee. Wow, it smells incredible. It smells very bright, almost sour notes. The elements that make this ritual unique is that there are no automatic coffee makers or buttons to press. Everything is done by hand with traditional vessels and cups. And while you smell the incense, you wait for the coffee to settle. I can smell it. I feel like I want to make three wishes. This is like an Aladdin moment. It's done, it's ready. It's ready. My first freshly ground and brewed salted Ethiopian coffee. And I did see that to pour it, you're about a foot high. But the reason why they put it up so high is yeah. to show how it's like settled coffee. There's no like sediment of the grind that's coming with it. Ama se ganalo. Ama se ganalo. Yes. Is thank you. It tastes very roasty, and I don't really detect much bitterness because of the salt. I do like the flavor, and I feel like after a nice, delicious, beautiful Ethiopian meal, that this would be amazing. This is a beautiful ceremony, and I, I feel, I feel loved. Thank you for coming. So many things I can say about the deliciousness that's in this cup. Coffee is literally the first thing I think about when I get up in the morning. It's a ritual for me. I have two cups in the morning, and I do actually use an instant coffee at home. I put in the grinds, I turn on my tea kettle, I have my favorite spoon. I have it down to a science. I know there's a certain taste that I'm looking for. One of my greatest pleasures in New York is just going alone with my phone, by myself, kick-ass cup of coffee. Coffee culture as we know it is pretty young in Pakistan. It is, after all, traditionally a tea-loving country. Around the early 2000s, the country witnessed an explosion of stylish cafes and coffee lounges where people would spend time chatting and catching up with friends in the major cities of Karachi, Lahore, and Islamabad. After some Ethiopian coffee brewing, I'm ready for something completely different. From Bushwick, I hopped on the subway back to Manhattan and took the two train to Riverdale in the Bronx, home of a Pakistani-influenced coffee house where the vibe and menu is unique to the culture, to the sisters, and to the family that operates it. It's something that Shiza and Zubi, sisters and best friends who run the day-to-day, -day, are keenly aware of and celebrate through their beautifully decorated cafe. Shiza and Zubi, this place is beautiful. It's so exquisite in here. I feel like I'm in a secret garden. Is the design of this place a nod to your cultural roots? Pakistan, we love floral patterns. We have an upside down garden. It does have a little bit of culture in it because I wanted my shop to be a reflection of myself. This was actually my school project. What? A yes. cafe? Yeah, so I did my master's. This is fashion school. So everyone did a boutique, but I did a cafe. I never planned to be a business owner, but my plan, my thesis came out so well, I fell in love with the idea. So one day, we were just driving to the city, and then we saw space for a lease. Mm. And then as a joke, my dad goes, she's like, you should open your coffee shop there. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then my mom goes, you know what, let's check it out. And so then from kind of a joke, now we have this thriving yes. coffee shop. In Pakistan, we say, if it's in your destiny, it's meant to be. Tell me about coffee culture there. The cafes, you would think you were in some five-star restaurant. It's amazing. And that's where I first saw like coffee shop that could be so beautiful that you would want to spend hours there. Your menu, the drinks, the recipes. There are some family recipes in there yes, somewhere? They are. Especially the whipped coffee. But in Pakistan, that's like a whole thing. So that's when I was like, let me do something which I can offer the community something different, you know, something unique. I stole my mother's recipe, so I can't take all the credit. She adds her spices, all the good stuff. So one day she made it for me. She goes, try this. I'm like, oh my 
my God, this is so good. This Pakistani style whipped coffee, it's got piti hui. I read. Piti bee coffee. I just say it's a Pakistani latte. With the latte, it's, it's a milk base and like two shots of espresso. With the whipped coffee, it's two scoops of the whip and then milk. But with this, ours is different because we use our spices. Mm -hmm. Like ours is with the powder coffee, which we get from Pakistan. The spices make it uniquely Pakistani. Exactly. I think that in every household that you go to, it's offered. And they actually whip it for like 45 minutes to an what? hour with their hand oh getting with that phone. With a fork, a cup, and yeah. then the authentic way. Shiza was game to show me how her whipped coffee is made, not by hand, but with an electric whisk. Let's make your Pakistani whipped coffee. Yes, of course. We start off with a couple of spoonfuls of instant Pakistani coffee. We're gonna do two big scoops. Right. Then add sugar, cardamom leaves, and cinnamon for more flavor. And green cardamom because that's a bit more aromatic and sweeter than yes, the black, right? It. That gets ground up with a mortar and pestle. Then we discard the leaves so that we can add the cardamom seed and cinnamon mixture into a pitcher and shake it all up. So and it does add so much flavor mm -hmm. to the whipped coffee. And you don't need a lot. A bit more water and it's time to mix. The color of the coffee will turn into a golden yellow and the consistency becomes velvety smooth. It looks silky and velvety. I want to drink it just like that. Now for the milk. Steam your milk of choice and be careful not to burn yourself. Wow! You can do this with your home coffee maker or gently heat up milk on your stovetop or microwave. When it's ready, add your whipped coffee concoction to the milk and stir it all together. Lastly, we top off the coffee with Shiza Spice Mix and our piti hui is ready. Now it's done. Thank you. It's delicious looking. Cheers. Cheers to you. Thank you. So the best part about this coffee is nice and light. It's not too strong. Mm -hmm. And then when you drink it, you could taste and smell the aroma and the sweet notes. You definitely can. Mm. And the herbs, the spicing is just yes. really unique. That's what sets this apart from other whipped coffee styles. No, no trying! My first memory of having coffee is I was at home and I remember having a sip of what my dad was drinking and I immediately didn't like it because it was bitter. He drank it plain and black. My dad liked coffee, but my mom really wouldn't let him drink it. Having a cup of whipped Pakistani coffee makes me think of my own roots in South Korea. There's a coffee that I make at home that's similar to that whipped coffee in preparation and in flavor. Algona coffee, it was a global viral sensation during lockdown. You could not look on any social media platform and not see this coffee. Dalgona is the name of a Korean sugar treat, which is why I'm making it. It tastes a bit like a burnt toffee. It's made with sugar and a little bit of baking soda just to kind of make it fizz up. The Dalgona coffee, super easy to make, it's just instant coffee, sugar, and the milk of your choice. I am making it my own by adding some peanut butter powder to the milk. The instant coffee, add a couple of tablespoons of that and hot water. It has to be hot water, kind of has like a chemical reaction along with the sugar to make it really fluffy once you whip it. You can use a mixer, of course, along with the frothing of it all that makes it fluffy and whipped and sugar and put on top of the milk to make it that delicious whipped coffee. Then I'm going to cut some of the Dalgona candy into it. Cheers. Mm. The ultimate Dalgona coffee. Mm. My fluffy Dalgona coffee recipe took a while to make with a whisk and mixer, but there's a sweet coffee drink that you can make with a blender instead. A cool vegan drink that you can customize with fruit, ice, and your milk of choice and I knew just the person who could show us how to make it. I stepped onto the one train and made my way to the Joe Coffee Pro Shop in Chelsea, where I met coffee guru and Jerusalem native Sean Benzvi to help her make an easy ice drink. Today, we're going to make a drink Israelis call barad, and it means hail in Hebrew, and it is an ice blended drink. So do the ices have to be like Hail size? It's it's the nod to ice. Yeah. Right? When you're drinking it, you get all those ice fragments in mm -hmm. your mouth and like it's cool very you. textured. 
We're going to use a banana. The spottier, probably the better. Sean showed me the best way of making a proper serving of Barat coffee. You can use any fruit you like. Maybe it's strawberries, apples, or a really ripe banana. Next, use about 12 ounces of ice. Then, weigh your ingredients with a scale. The more precise you are, the better it will taste, which will give you a perfect consistency and an amazing flavor. Grab our salted caramel. So this is what you made at home. What's in this? So basically just sugar, oat, sweetened condensed milk, okay. vegan butter, and vanilla extract. Last part, the most important part. The coffee! The coffee! <laughs> Trade it into our blender. Ooh, look at that nice, beautiful color. Oh, it already looks so delicious. Now we blend. We're gonna do a little caramel drizzle magic in here. Mm -hmm. And this is such a great base recipe because, as you said, we can add other fruits, other things. We can add whipped cream at the end. Let's pour a little bit. Let's take this off. Oh, yes. More! No, Good the lord, the honey. Okay. Look at this. Thank you, Shanda Bahad. Nechaim. You ready? Shall we? Yeah. Mmm. You know what? It's not too sweet at all. It's not that sweet. Fam, you're gonna want to make this. Oh my god, how fun! Caramel's not. Yeah. Okay. When you think of Brazil, what comes to mind? Is it Carnival, the country's most festive holiday? Or maybe you can name the country's famous soccer players, like Pele or Ronaldo. Whether Brazil reminds you of samba dancing or caipirinhas on the beach, one thing's for sure, Brazilians know their coffee. It's the world's largest coffee producer by far. Creamy Dalgona coffee and slushy barad frappes are delicious and sweet. And so is my former roommate, Karini Silva. Not only is she a fantastic cook, she's got a simple yet decadent recipe many Brazilians love. A small confection with a coffee twist that packs a punch. Let's head uptown to Harlem. Coffee time with my Brazilian bombshell, Karini. What is your first memory of having coffee? I drank coffee when I was little with pão de queijo, which is another Brazilian. The pão de queijo, that bread, yeah, the cheesy bread. bread. It reminds me of my childhood, mm. like how, you know, my mom used to make coffee, the smell of coffee in the house, you know, in the morning, before school. So coffee, it's everything for us. I read that when you go to any Brazilian house, you're almost greeted with this. It's almost yes. like saying hello. Yes, everybody goes like, oh, you want to have a cafezinho? <laughs> and, and everyone says, of course, yes, right? Yes, we always have coffee ready. Every house you go in Brazil. Brazilians like their coffee quite simple, right? Most of the people drink it pure, mm -hmm. black, no sugar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Brazil is the capital of Brazil. It's a young city. It's actually very modern. The architecture there is very interesting. The map of the city, it's shaped as an airplane. So really? You yeah, you have the east wing, the west wing, so they brought a little bit yes. of the cultures from different states to Brazil. So Brazil is kind of a mixing pot. So we have coffee from Sao Paulo, people brought the coffee culture. Then you have pão de queijo from Minas Gerais. So you have a little bit of everything. Including a traditional and much loved dessert that's Brazil's version of a bonbon called the brigadeiro. This sweet, similar to a truffle, is made with condensed milk, butter, and cocoa powder. While the exact origin is uncertain, the story goes that a confectioner created the chocolate treat to promote the presidency of Brigadier Eduardo Gomez. And while Gomez lost the election, the Brigadero endured. Brigadero. This is such a quintessential Brazilian dessert. Karini showed me a few other options of making a Brigadero with fresh berries or peanut crumble. And I also brought a few other ingredients along, like coconut shavings and pistachios. But because brigadeiros are chocolatey, adding a little coffee always makes these richer and more delicious. And they go great with a cafezinho. In Brazil, like now, we have what we call the gourmet brigadeiro, where you add all different ingredients, so you can add coffee to it. And it's pretty delicious, actually. What are the ingredients that go in? So milk. condensed milk, cocoa powder, coffee, and butter. Right. <laughs> now this cacao, this is a Brazilian. All these ingredients are, are from Brazil. Are from yeah. Brazil. Like, so beautiful with the little es this, the espresso bean on top. The bitter coffee bean with the sweetness of the condensed milk really goes well really together, goes right? Well. Yeah. Let's make some. 
So what it. is this? So this is like the... This is the actual, the actual mix itself. The mix itself. So then you add the, the condensed milk. Okay. Uh, the chocolate. The cacao. The cacao, the cacao. Okay. And then we put the coffee and basically a little bit of butter. And that's it. And you, you stir you it over? You stir it over until it gets thick. Once you see that it's detaching from the pan, yeah. that's when the, it's good. It starts to pull away and like yeah. sort of congeal a little bit yes. to this, right? Yes. Then it's gonna cool. And once it's ready, you put it in the freezer for like one hour. That way we can handle it. Yeah. yeah. To make the truffles, we get a little bit of butter. Okay. We put a little butter. In our hands in our so it hands. doesn't stick. No, oh, it feels your good. Hair. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so then you're gonna get a spoon right. of brigadeiro. You're gonna make little balls. And then here I have the sprinkles, right? It's very rich. Thick, decadent kind of dessert. This is the perfect base. So these are the chocolate sprinkles, and these are very classic traditional, yeah, isn't it? The Brazilian traditional brigadeiro. <laughs> these cute tins are so perfect for like a party. Put it on. So cute. <laughs> Let's top it up oh, with yeah. the little coffee of bean. Of course, the coffee bean. <laughs> the cool thing too is that if you wanted to make this for a party, you can make a bunch and then put it in the freezer. It's perfect. Oh, it's really, really good. Really, really decadent. And this is the perfect size. Obrigada, Karine. Thank you so much. <laughs> My sweet tooth is on high today, and I'm jonesing another coffee dessert. So I'm hopping on the 7 train off to Woodside, Queens to meet a baker that makes a well-known Italian pastry flavored with Filipino coffee beans for a unique twist. Meet Mark. He's a former company man who became dissatisfied with his corporate job and decided to open his own bakery because he thought it would be fun. Not long ago, he knew absolutely nothing about running a bakery or making desserts. He only knew that he wanted to do something different. Uh -huh. I want to open a restaurant. I was young enough to do it. I was in my early 30s when I did it. And I just like told my boss, here's my two weeks notice. Really? And that's it. The name Purple Dough, what does that mean? We started just a cupcake shop. Mm. Me and my wife just making chocolate and vanilla cupcake. But people start coming here saying, how come you have any ube? Right. And I learned how to make ube in the shop. Ube is a Filipino purple yam. Right. And we want something in the English word with a Filipino meaning. Mm -hmm. So I came up with a purple and we need a bakery name. Okay. So she came up with a dough mm -hmm. and that's how purple dough came about. A lot of your menu items are distinctly from where you're from. Tell me about that. Yes. I'm born in São Paulo City. It's a section where actually they grow predominantly ube. The coffee culture from where you're from, what's that like? I grew up in Manila. It's very city-ish. It's very, you know, like suburban. So the coffee, we're always drinking in the morning. And that's it, basically. Mm -hmm. Just to wake you up and whatnot. And just black? Like, would you do it with, say, condensed milk as opposed it's to, It's always say... been black and just with a teaspoon of sugar. Mark, I want to talk about the coffee from Philippines. It's the baraco bean, which is very unique. It's very indicative of the Philippines. That's right. And it is stronger, which makes it great for something like what we're going to make. Now, the dessert that you created using the baraco, tell me about it. So basically, we went with the uh, simple concept of a tiramisu, yeah. but we made a little bit more Filipino style. We made a Filipino. Using real ingredients from the Philippines. We're going to show you how we do our Filipino version of a tiramisu. Right. It's more like a trifle that we're doing. Okay, so we have the cake, and then? Then we have the uh, coffee baraco, which we're going to soak the uh, sponge cake with. Right. Then we have Two types of cream here today. Instead of going with the mascarpone cheese, right. we actually went with the uh, yema custard. It's a traditional Filipino custard. It has only had three ingredients. We use egg yolks. Okay. By cooking the egg yolks with evaporated and condensed milk. Uh -huh. Then we cook it by whipping it and by keep stirring it until it becomes more like a caramel style. Right, it's rich and creamy, which is so delicious in coffee. <laughs> yes. Reminds me of Vietnamese style coffee as well. Okay, and then you said this is the other type of cream. It's the same cream process, oh. but instead we added mango in it. Oh! So it's both cream and this one is added mango. This is the cocoa powder. Let's put this together. Put the uh, sponge cake onto the bottom of the cup. All right, put this in. Uh-oh. Just stuff it in there, make sure it touches the bottom. Then we put coffee, we soak it in the coffee. I think that should do it. Okay, then another put, layer. Then we put the cream. We put the first cream this of the... Uh, that, that should be much? good. Just to good. enough to cover the sides. Right. I feel like I'm <laughs> doing like a, a children's easy bake with this size. Mango cream goes in here now. This is basically a flattened rice. 
Oh, flatten rice and gives it texture. Yes, and we cook it so it'll give a little toast. It adds that little aroma taste to it. I layered our Barocco coffee soaked sponges, alternating between the yama and mango custards until it filled the cup. Then we'll finish it by decorating the uh, cocoa powder yes. top. Oh, that's it. And here it is. I'm going to try this Barocco coffee. Okay, my first Barocco coffee. Mmm, smells good. Cheers. Cheers to you. Cheers. Oh my gosh, that's so delicious. It'll go really well with this Filipino style tiramisu trifle. Oh man, that looks good. Wow. The yama cream is really luxurious and silky. I love it. Thank you, Mark, so much. Well, thank you. <laughs> Mabuhay! I have often thought about if I were to ever open a cafe. I even took a barista course because I wanted to learn all of the different positions of what a cafe would entail. Of course, I'd work there. I love the marriage of like great, cool music with like delicious coffee. I'd bring all my friends there. In my romantic idea of what my cafe would be, it would just be like a cool place to hang out and just continue to add to the creativity that New York City has. My coffee journey around New York City has taken me to the hills of Addis Abeba, where I learned how to roast fresh Yurga Chef beans in a pan and brew them in an ancient vessel called a jebina. It's also taken me to the colorful streets of Lahore, where I whipped up a sophisticated brew of piti hui. And then to Seoul, where I relished my own velvety version of Dalgona coffee. We stopped into Jerusalem for a cooling frappe with ice chunks the size of small hail. Then we dropped into Brasilia, where I enjoyed the decadent taste of cafezinho wrapped in a bite-sized chocolate truffle. My final stop was in the Philippines by way of Woodside to enjoy a new take on an old dessert flavored with Baraco coffee. The best part is I didn't have to pack my bags or fight traffic to get to the airport. I got on a train and explored six different countries without leaving the five boroughs, and I even learned a little something about each culture. And with a little bit of curiosity and a sense of adventure, you can too.